invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 16, page 55 in your pew Bibles, under the heading Bread from Heaven. We're going to read excerpts from chapter 16, uh, verses 2 through 4 and verses 9 through 15. The setting is the the people of Israel, after a long period of enslavement, being held as slaves in Egypt, have been liberated. Their liberation was not easy. In fact, it was quite costly. But through powerful words and deeds, They have walked across the sea, through the sea on dry land, and now they are headed to the promised land. But they find themselves in the wilderness. And predictably, inevitably, these are human beings after all, not all that different from us. They begin to complain. Chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people will go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them. Hold on to that. I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Moving forward to verse 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there was on the surface of the wilderness a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. And the Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. We thank God for the words of God that come to us through this story of old. Amen. So I'm a cancer patient now. For this may be more detail than you need to know. And it's a story that I don't pretend is particularly unique or heroic. Many of you have walked much more arduous paths. Many of you, either with yourself or for family members, have experienced or accompanied someone 
on a journey through cancer. And to you and to the words of encouragement and insight that have come, respect, prayers, love. My particular cancer is prostate cancer. One in six males will develop prostate cancer. So public service announcement, very important, particularly by the time you hit 40, 50, have your PSA checked regularly. And one reason I'm approaching my particular cancer rather confidently and, opt and optimistically for the last five years, I've had my PSA checked regularly. It's been going up. PSA is prostate-specific antigen indicating it's, it's one of the indicators of possible cancer within a system. But the last five years, I've had it checked regularly. I've had three MRIs and two biopsies. And this last May, it was determined, yeah, there's some spots in your prostate that are concerning, and at least two of them uh, seem to be cancerous. It's time that we do something about it. No longer is active surveillance the best option for you. And so I was given the option of uh, how to proceed. And, uh, could be surgery where the prostate itself is removed, or radiation. And for my specific cancer, at my specific age, the statistics, the prognosis is, if, with either, it's about the same. You know, pretty optimistic of 15-year survival rate. I mean, 15-year you know, survival rate for anything is pretty good. So uh, I chose, after listening in, uh, to uh, go the path of radiation treatments. My particular physician, Dr. David Cornguth of the uh, Golden Gate Cancer Center on Mission Street in San Francisco is, is highly regarded uh, nationally and certainly in the Bay Area. And the radiation machine that uh, he and his team work with is among the newest and, and best in the, in the Bay built in, in 2020. And even surgeons I interviewed would say, oh, Dr. Cornguth and his machine, oh, you'll get a really good result there. So I decided that I would begin a series of 28 radiation treatments, Monday through Friday for, uh, you know, six weeks. So my routine that I've developed so far, I'm nine treatments into the 28, 19 to go. Uh, the routine I've developed so far is I, I park here at the church, walk down in front of Noah's Bagel, and you see the, the, the rent-a-bike stands there, maybe you've seen it, bay wheels, lift bikes. Get a bike, ride to Lake Merritt uh, BART station, 1.53 miles. If I'm really going and hit all the stoplights, 12 minutes. If the stupid bus is in my way, 16 minutes. Get on Lake Merritt BART, 20-minute ride to 16th and Mission uh, Station. You can get there either by the yellow line, the blue line, or the green line. Get out at 16th and Mission. It's, uh, if you've ever been to the 16th and Mission Station, it's, it's alive with humanity. Walk about four blocks down Mission to 1611 Mission Street. Walk in, and almost invariably, I don't even have to sit, they say, hey, Jim, we're ready for you. Uh, I walk in, and the radiation technicians, Vlad and Grace, greet me, ask me how I've been doing, and ask me two questions. And by now, I get them right every time. Name, Herbert James Hopkins. Birth date, 11 1955 Proving that that's me, but the picture and the birth date and the name, I get on the table. And they tell me I'm a good patient. They probably tell that to, say that to everyone. They say I'm particularly good at laying still. That's a, that's a good, good skill to have. And of course, my family would agree, dad's known how to do nothing for years. So, been very good at that. 
well, he's still for about five minutes. They come in, great job, see you tomorrow. Don't really hear anything, don't really see anything. I just kind of go through this little tube, lay there for five minutes, and then reverse and go home. So my particular cancer is not among the most threatening. I mean, it's still a scary thing, right? I don't want to underplay it. And always the concern that cancer is, having been identified, is where else is it? Or is it growing somewhere? And one of the reasons that I chose radiation versus surgery is that if there's a chance, it doesn't seem likely as they evaluate my particular cancer, if there's a chance that it, it has spread from the, the prostate itself to the lymph nodes, um, where it can go into the rest of the system, that surgery would not address that, whereas radiation will. Okay, so that's one of the reasons I opted for this particular form of treatment. So while I'm feeling pretty healthy, pretty optimistic, I'll be glad when the 28 treatments are over. In the, in the Golden Gate Cancer Center, there's a Tibetan gong. And when you complete your round of treatments, all 28 of them, you get to ring the gong. I am looking forward to ringing the gong. But those of you who have faced cancer, lived with cancer, are living with it now, you know that cancer is a journey. And it's fitting that we read the story of the people of Israel in the wilderness this morning because cancer is certainly one of life's wilderness experiences. Where's this going? How did we get here? What will the outcome be? All these things are really difficult to answer and there's, there's just, there needs to be a degree of uncertainty. We don't know. In the wilderness of cancer, there's a whole lot of we don't know. But in the scripture of the morning, there are a couple of things. First of all, one of the words that repeats or experiences that repeats and again and again in the scripture, and you heard it as we read it, complain. The people complained, the people complained, the people complained. And we could jump on them and say, oh, they, they should have had more faith than that. But that's what people do, right? When we're up against the uncertain, we just, that's the human response. I don't like this, I don't get it, I wish it were over. And that is a very, it's maybe not the most helpful response, but it's a very human response. It's a legitimate response, and I don't like it, I don't get it, I wish it were over, does not need to be condemned. It's just part of the territory. But in the face of the, I don't get it, I don't like it, I don't know, there's the provision. There's the provision of bread from heaven, quail, the cloud of presence, the pillar of fire. There's provision and presence. The, the provision is substantial, concrete. The, the presence is much more difficult to grasp, in fact, impossible, if not dangerous, to even try and grasp. Have you ever tried to hold the cloud or hold the fog? Can't be done, but it's there. And one is well advised not to hold the fire or try and hold the fire. That's it's a dangerous arrogant thing to try and do. 
And in the wilderness of cancer, certainly there is provision. Provision. Provision of caring friends. I don't know how many texts do I get a day? How are you doing? How many emails? How many prayers? How many prayers get sent to me? How many words of encouragement? Uh, words of insight from others who have gone through it? It's provision. There's ample provision. There's one thing that's very true for me as I go through this wilderness is I don't go through it alone. Ample provision. Thank you. In the scripture, as the people are promised the bread, there's this curious wording. I will rain down bread from heaven on them in order to test them. What in the world is that about? I will rain down blessings on them in order to test them. I read different commentaries and I tried to look up the Hebrew meaning of it. It's just a, it's a very obscure reference that I will rain down bread from heaven on them in order to test them. And, and the best that I can come up with, the best that I can come up with, that is in wilderness experiences, in face of great challenge, when there is some sort of profound presence and provision, with that provision comes great responsibility. With the gift comes responsibility. One, not to ignore the gift. Two, not to go down the road of saying, I'm special, I deserve this somehow. But to acknowledge the sustenance, the medical care, the spiritual encouragement, the physical encouragement as a gift. And with that gift comes profound responsibility to not disrespect it, to not claim it as something deserved. You don't know him, I, at least I don't think many of you know him. Dr. Scott Arnold is the pastor of First Baptist Church of Los Angeles. And Scott is a cancer survivor himself and has had walked through one of his now young adult but then teenage sons experience of a very serious cancer diagnosis. And Scott has written a book that I've been benefiting from called Soul Fruit. Bearing Blessings Through Cancer. And, and to summarize a little bit of what Scott is saying is that in the midst of cancer and in from the midst of us in the United States who get cancer, who are surrounded by just a magnificent medical system, all kinds of highly skilled people able to bring highly developed technology and medicine to bear just so we can live a few more years. That with that gift comes a responsibility. And that responsibility Scott defines as soul fruit. Gifts of the soul of kindness, gentleness, honesty, integrity, humility. That is our responsibility of those of us who are gifted with at least attempted cure. It's our responsibility to bear some soul fruit. This is, here are some of the words that Scott writes. With a mixture of feelings and a desire to be responsive to God's leading, I began, and this was upon word that his son had a very serious form of cancer. 
I began to study scripture and log onto my laptop that morning. God began to show me a clear connection. God blesses us through the tough times of life by growing and nurturing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Quite often, adversity in life is the ground for soul fruit within us that is born of God's Spirit through strength and character. Skipping up. Cancer is a disease, and blessings can be discovered when facing disease, trials, or troubles in life. I am not. I am not saying that cancer as a disease is the blessing. What I am saying is that when we can experience God's blessing while dealing with cancer or any other illness, Likewise, we can experience the strength of loving communities and the blessings of love shared through cancer. All of us ultimately need a greater healing and hope. Cancer itself is not a gift. It's a threat. It's a danger. But like many threats and dangers, while we can't control their presence in our lives, what we can have some level of control over is our response to them. How do they shape us? Where do they lead us? What is their impact in our lives, in our communities? Do they bear, cause us, encourage us? to bear soul fruit. One word word from, from Scott. Ultimately, ultimately the challenges of life call for faith in God. Cancer is but one of many reminders that we are mere mortals in need of God's saving grace. It's not that cancer is the sin, but that cancer is the result of a broken and sinful world where creation itself has been corrupted. I mean, why is cancer such a prevalent experience in human life? It's a representative of the truth that creation itself has been challenged, stressed at many points, broken. Our bodies, as well as the created order of this earth, have been polluted by the consequence of humanity's choices that started in the Garden of Eden. While many people would avoid this factor when considering cancer, it remains evident that God calls us to be participants in his redemptive work for creation. Here's some words. Here's some words that represent for me the seeds of the soul fruit that I hope I am experiencing and sharing. The first soul fruit word for me is among. A-M-O-N-G. Among. In the Gospel of John, the promise of Jesus among of us, us is that he would dwell among us, among us, full of grace and truth. Not above us, not below us, among us. And as I <laughs> take my daily journey down Lakeshore Avenue, on the BART train, into the Golden Gate Cancer Center. As I see my, in this most case, my brother patients. Good morning, how are you guys doing? There's a gift, there's a giftedness just in being among the community. Not above, not better than, not below not particularly more astute or adroit or anything, just among, among the living, 
among the gifted, among, among the challenged, among the blessed. There's a goodness, a goodness in being among, just among. other words that come are sufficient for the day. You can, take, you can tell I'm keeping track. Nine down, 19 to go. Every day the same journey. Every day the same routine. Every day the same promise. My grace is sufficient for you today. Go back to the story of the people in the wilderness. There was quail for the evening, bread in the morning, enough for the day. Any attempt to get ahead, any attempt to hoard, stockpile, commodify, resulted in failure. There is a promise of enoughness, but only for the day. Don't get ahead of the day. And the third words is that trusting. Trusting is far, far different than understanding. Tuesday last week, I walked into the treatment center, Herbert James Hopkins, November 21st, 1955, I said to Vlad and Grace, hey, now, before I get on the table, tell me how this thing works. I said, I was like, is there some radioactive chemical in there? And Vlad said, no, it's like, you know that big linear accelerator they have in France? This is just that on a very small scale. I said, yeah, I understand that. So, trusting. Trusting in the wisdom of the professionals. Trusting in the unseen presence of God. Trusting of, in the provision of strangers. Trusting is far different than understanding. In a few moments, we'll be at the table of communion. Break the bread. Drink the cup. The great theologian John Calvin said of the Eucharist, I would much rather experience it than understand it. When we come to the table, any ultimately, any profession of understanding is above our pay grade. We trust. We trust its beauty. We trust its meaning. We trust what it represents far more than we understand. And so it is. So it is as we claim God's provision in the face of challenges like cancer. Trusting is far, far different than understanding. I've heard from a lot of folks. I continue to hear from a lot of folks. My friend, Reverend Greg Ledbetter, who was ordained here at Lakeshore 40 years ago, celebrating his 40th anniversary of his ordination this, this month, I think preached a sermon in 2009 called, or titled, Sustained. He writes, I think of my old preacher friend, Bill Coffin, who lost his son in an automobile accident, preaching 10 days after that tragic loss. Talk about a wilderness experience. Bill said to his congregation, God may not protect us in the ways we'd like, but God sustains us in the ways we need. 
I have been sustained, he said. I have been upheld. That's my testimony. I am being sustained. I am being upheld. And then Greg closed that ser- his sermon with a paraphrase of the 23rd Psalm from Psalms Now, 1973, Concordia Publishing House. God, you are my constant companion. There is no need that you cannot fulfill. Whether your course for me points to the mountaintops of glorious ec- ecstasy or to the valleys of human suffering, you are by my side. You are ever present with me. You are close beside me when I tread the dark streets of danger. And even when I flirt with death itself, you will not leave me when the pain is severe. You are near to comfort. When the burden is heavy, you are there to lean upon. When depression darkens my soul, you touch me with eternal joy. When I feel empty and alone, you fill the aching vacuum with your power. My security is in your promise to be near me always and in the knowledge that you will never let me go. So I'm a cancer patient now. I'm learning. I hope my experience, be it spiritually or be it medically, will be of benefit to someone else. I'm a cancer patient now. That means I'm in a great, great company of those who have experienced, will experience something similar. I'm a cancer patient now. That means that in unique and profound ways, I am being sustained and I am being upheld. So I'm grateful, certainly not for the disease itself, but for what I'm learning and for those I'm traveling with, including each of you. Amen. Amen.